A popular way of finding meaning in life is to create people and care for them. Another popular way of finding meaning is to imagine a God who has created us and cares for us. This similarity was noticed and embraced by many religions where gods are often referred to as parents of the humans they created. The parallel continues when we consider the decision to create people and question its validity. As parents, we can derive justification from God in the form of a commandment, but that doesn't explain the divine motivation. And since gods are just characters we created, their psychology often reflects our own. For example, when God creates man in his own image and in the likeness of God, this is reminiscent of the human desire to create a version of ourselves. As if to strengthen this point, the man that God created later has a son in his own likeness, in his own image. But the Genesis creation story is really a compilation, and these quotes originate from a single source. The other creation story reveals a different motivation for creating people. There was no one to work the ground, and it was man's job to work it and take care of it. This may have been inspired by existing mythologies, like the one recounted in the Enuma Elish, I will create man on whom the toil of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. The same logic applies when a father names his son Noah, related to the Hebrew words for comfort and resting, because he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands. But more generally, having children who can work in the field was and is a real consideration, though the nature of their contribution has evolved over time. It appears then that we associate the creation of people with the creator's personal gain, even narcissism. This is quite explicit in the scriptures of the main Abrahamic religions. In the Old Testament, God speaks of his sons and daughters whom he created for his glory. This idea is repeated in Jewish writings and recited at every Jewish wedding. The glory carries over to the New Testament with many references and the assertion that all things were created by him and for him. And according to the Quran, God created humans only to be worshipped. What does this suggest about God's emotional state without people? Creation triggered by loneliness, emptiness or boredom appears in many creation stories around the world, all reflecting the human fear of existing without bringing others into existence. To counter the possible impression of neediness, this 14th century commentary makes it clear that God did not create us in order to satisfy a need. Similar clarifications appear in Christianity, Judaism, and even Hinduism. But the real magic happens when the word for worship is reinterpreted and God is portrayed as a treasure of loving kindness that shouldn't remain hidden and therefore creates people to benefit from the treasure. This view, and its parallels in other Abrahamic religions, try to distance the act of creation from egocentric concerns like narcissism and fear and instead to place it in the realm of altruism. The former reveals the unflattering truth of human motivation, whereas the latter reflects what we like to tell ourselves about creating people. If this line does ring true, it's because it is ambiguous. Raising children is altruistic, but creating a person for that person's sake is logically impossible. And if God wanted to create creatures in order that he could do good for them, as one scholar put it, then he was merely satisfying the need to be altruistic, making this another self-serving consideration. Sadly, the same is true of procreation, and what makes it problematic is all the potential suffering that is realized when life is created. The suffering creates an ethical problem for the individual, as well as a theological conundrum known as the problem of evil. The question is the same, how do you justify creating life that will suffer? The parental and divine responses once again relate to each other. For example, both use the argument of necessary evil. As parents, we say you can't appreciate the good without the bad, and Christian apologists claim that all the suffering God created in the natural world was the only way to bring about the beauty and diversity of the biosphere. 
Parents and gods can also argue that the good we experience outweighs the bad, though it helps when you're not confined to reality. Then there's the collectivist approach that justifies the suffering of individuals on the way to a blissful future for all. Or you can just glorify suffering, again providing justification both for God and for parents confronted with antinatalism. But there's a reason these responses feel inadequate, especially in God's case. Antinatalism is essentially perfectionism applied to the prevention of suffering. Anything else is an imperfect solution, which is conceivable for mere mortals, but not for a creator you imagine as perfect. To make any sense at all, our creator has to have some form of imperfection. Perhaps he's not completely benevolent. The Gnostic sects believed we were created by an evil god, which is why some of them were antinatalists. Or perhaps God is not all-powerful, as in Zoroastrianism, where creation is part of God's plan to defeat evil. You can even find creators who didn't know any better. Creation just sort of happened. But what you won't find in any religion is a God who is truly omnipotent, omnibenevolent and omniscient, who made a decision to create immense suffering where there was none at all.